it's nice to be here. It's an honor to be here and um, a pleasure to do anything that Celia ever asked me to do. I'm always happy to do. So um, I was asked to talk about the revised common rule with particular attention to informed consent. And uh, not knowing how much time you have spent reading the regulations, the new regulations, or thinking about them, or uh, reading the preamble, I hope not too much time. Um, uh, I wanted to spend some time talking about it and then thinking together about some of the ethical implications. So by way of disclosure, uh, I wear a number of hats. Um, fundamentally, I think of myself as an, a clinician and an ethicist where what matters to me most are the rights and welfare of humans. Um, I also wear the hat of a hospital administrator where I have to listen carefully to the cries and demands and woes of clinical research faculty who are struggling to do their work and to maintain funding and to recruit research subjects. And the long and gory history of research ethics is that sometimes those two initiatives, caring for patients, caring for subjects, looking out for their rights and welfare, and the need to push research forward collide with one another, as you know. And I think one of the questions that I'd like to think about as we talk about the new rule, and maybe you've had other lectures where you talked about other aspects of it, but I want us to think about what actually in the new rule fosters human subjects' protections to think about it, and, and, and what's really about enhancing or streamlining the modern research enterprise, and what does both, what does neither. So that's one disclosure. My disclosure is that I have an internal conflict that will become apparent as we talk. Um, and the second is a warning. Uh, certainly now that it's 12.30, I have more slides than I could possibly cover in the remaining time, so bear with me. I'll try to do what I think is most important. And I may skip over some that are probably less relevant to you. So um, have you had talks about other aspects of the revised common rule here? Good. All right. Great. So uh, essentially, this the common rule, which people probably know, is a set of federal regulations which was signed on currently by 16 federal agencies and dates back to 1991. What made it common, it was that it was an effort for all the various en uh, entities in the federal government that fund, support, and regulate research to agree on a basic set of regulatory parameters to guide the ethical conduct of research. And um, the original incarnation was 81. The common rule was developed in 91. And there were no substantive changes to the common rule until this year. Um, the process began actually in 2011 with what was called an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. In 2015, something called the notice of proposed rulemaking with a request for public comments was issued. It yielded an enormous amount of public input, which actually helped shape the final rule, which was published this January, January of 2017. The rule goes into effect a year from this past January, or January 2018. The notion behind the rule was that it was an effort to bring the research regulations in line with modern research practice. Uh, that meant in an era where there is an enormous emphasis on the use and reuse of data and biospecimens, there needed to be a regulatory framework, and, and here's my first bias comment, that doesn't get in the way of research. Okay. At the same time, the regulators, many of whom we know well, <laughs> who actually were involved in the, in the creation of this, um, are very interested in protecting fundamental rights of research participants. And also, we're very interested in listening to the community, the regulated community, and the community <coughs> of participants who commented to help them shape what the regulations would ultimately look like. The regulations include changes in these six areas, but I'm only going to talk about the last in any detail. The scope and applicability of the regulations has changed. And I'll just say about that, that institutions for many years have had the authority under the federal regulations to decide to apply all of the regulations 
to all research, whether it was federally funded or not. As a matter of regulation, their federal-wide assurance, which was the agreement they had with the federal government uh, to conduct research, could be broadly applied across all research conducted at the institution. That authority no longer exists. It is still the case that Fordham or UCSD or NYU can still decide as a, as a matter of local policy to apply the research regulations to all research, whether it's funded or not, whether it's federally funded or not, but institutions actually have latitude to do that or not right now. And the authority of the federal government to intervene or make requirements of non-federally funded research has changed to some extent. There's a number of changes to regulatory definitions. The most important, and we'll touch on these, is that certain activities have been deemed to not be research any longer. And as you know, there was a lot of debate in the community, certainly in, uh, for example, oral historians and journalists who argued our research should not be reviewed by IRBs. What we're doing doesn't constitute research in, in line with the meaning of the federal regulations. And so now, the definition of human subjects research actually mm -hmm. explicitly ex excludes certain scholarly activities and that would include journalism, oral history, and certain things like that. We can probably debate, and will, over the course of our careers, what like that means. <laughs> there are a number of revisions to the exemption categories. So the way it works, for those of you who don't live and breathe this stuff, is that if something <coughs> meets the definition of research, and it involves what the definition would call a human subject, right? So if it's research and it involves human subjects, then it's human subjects research and requires IRB review, unless it fits into one of these exemption categories. We'll talk about those in passing, uh, and I know that you have, some of you have questions about how your work relates to that. And as we begin to think about the difference between regulations and ethics, I think some of the exemptions raise concerns for me and people at my institution, certainly the groups who do research with substance abuses and HIV, about whether certain categories of research which are eligible for exemption under the regulations should nonetheless be subject to some kind of oversight. This is the big deal uh, that no longer is it the case that those of us who are involved in multi-center research, the regulations call it cooperative research, multi-site or multi-center research will have to have multiple IRBs re review it. In fact, the regulations require that only a single IRB can review cooperative research except for international studies. So any US-based studies that involve numerous institutions essentially have to only have a single IRB review it. Now, there's debate going on around that. I was on a <coughs> call this week where the folks from the, F, from the VA felt strongly that there needs to be exceptions to that rule, that there are many cases in which, let's say, one or two institutions are involved where the actual administrative work in choosing and implementing a single IRB review process is more burdensome to the investigator than having each institution. So there's guidance being written now under when there could be exceptions to this <coughs> single IRB requirement. There are changes to some IRB review requirements. The one that will make most people happy is that it is no longer the case that research that is minimal risk will be subject to continuing review. The regulations, the pre-2018 regulations were written in such a way that it said all research uh, must be reviewed at least annually. And that meant each year you had to go through this process of continuing review. That's no longer the case. What I want you to start thinking about is how comfortable you are, either as an institutional representative or someone running a department or someone conducting research, that once the IRB approves your research, you're on your own. <coughs> 
I mean, a lot of people find the oversight irritating or annoying or unnecessary. At the same time, we need to think about what it will be like absent that kind of oversight over time. Many people find it comforting. And then we're going to talk about this today. There are five or six things that I want to touch on today. The first <coughs> is really important, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who was talking about this. But the first is that there is a change in, in fact, the preamble that leads up to the requirements describing informed consent in the regulations, which basically says we want investigators to be thinking more about how the consent form and process is organized and what kind of content is included. It's the first change, really, that, that emphasizes <coughs> emphasis in how the information is provided. And it's the first time that there's really a focus on this notion that maybe you can present information in a way that more meaningfully enhances understanding. The new regulations introduce broad consent. He's an expert here on broad consent. I actually, I take it back. I don't think anyone's an expert on broad <laughs> consent yet. Uh, um, which is an optional approach permitting the storage, maintenance, and secondary research use of identifiable data or biospecimens. So let me just talk about that just for one brief second, and we'll get into it in more details in a moment. You know, so much of the uh, fuss about the notice of proposed rulemaking related to the notion of biospecimens. Because in the notice of proposed rulemaking and broad consent, a biospecimen, even a de-identified biospecimen, was considered, would any work with a biospecimen was considered human subjects research. In other words, there were a lot of protections that were put in place to limit or safeguard the use of even de-identified biospecimens. And that didn't come from nowhere. It came from data which the federal regulators believed was compelling, which, in which people, subjects, the community, argued they cared about what happened to their biospecimens, regardless of whether it had their name on it or not. I mean, that's fundamentally, we could argue, an empirical question. But in fact, when the regulators issued this notice of proposed rulemaking in 2015, the public backlash was significant. And in fact, the concern was too much emphasis on safeguarding even de-identified biospecimens would occur at the cost of good and important research. And so the feds changed the position and they altered the final rule, broad consent remains a way of dealing with identifiable data or biospecimens, which is more liberal from the research perspective than what came before. But the important point here is that while the focus is in the debate has always been on biospecimens, some of you do, but most of you collect data, okay? And so this also pertains to the use, the secondary use of identifiable data or biospecimens. And in a world now where we are increasingly being asked to reproduce the work we do or show that we can produce others' work and reuse or get the most out of data, the notion of being able to better use, better access, store, share data is, I think, critical to the well-being of the research enterprise. And I think it's important to think about that. Now, the NIH is constantly these days under pressure to explain why there are so few studies that are reproducible. And so this notion is that this, in, in a way, will support that. And then there's one change to waiver requirements, waiver of consent. As I mentioned before, if it's research and it involves human subjects and it's not exempt, then the default position is that a waiver, that, a, that consent is required unless a waiver of consent can be granted. The other things that have changed is that there's an elimination of consent for certain activities preparatory for research. This is also actually a big deal for most people's research and for your research. The notion that you have to get a consent to collect information about prospective research participants or that you need to get subject permission to look at identifiable data in a database to identify who may be appropriate, and this is for your CURE study, I think is relevant. You are just a cure study. Um, but we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. 
it doesn't waive consent. It actually eliminates the requirement for consent when it's part of a broader protocol. This business here has to do with a new requirement for certain studies. Mostly you won't be involved in these studies. But for clinical trials, that requires that consent forms be publicly posted. And then there's a, a change in who may serve as a legally authorized representative for incapable subjects in a way that uh, I think is good, but also raises for me some concerns. A lot of people review the regs and complain about what they consider an overemphasis on the form as opposed to the process. And in fact, it's really common when you hear people in research ethics kind of talk, talk about, you know, informed consent is not a, a form, it's a process. But as somebody who has read, I don't know, many tens of thousands of consent forms in my life, I've really come to believe that a good consent form can really help shape a good consent process. And that in that many people who, who conduct the consent process may be relatively inexperienced or clinically naive or new to the research protocol, we can imagine that if we can shape the interaction between the researcher and the subject in a meaningful way, it can help guide in terms of what's important, what questions need to be presented to the subject, what needs to be focused on, we can actually guide that. And I've been carrying on about this notion for a long time. And so I was really happy that in the final rule, one of the requ new requirements for consent is that the informed consent must be organized and presented in a way that does not merely provide lists of isolated facts, but rather facilitates the prospective subject's understanding of the reason why one might or might not want to participate in the research. Now, that may seem like the most obvious thing on earth. But the reality of informed consent, as you know, is very far from that kind of reality or truth. And so to me, simply creating the expectation that we as a field, and, and I'll say especially those of you involved in the empirical work in research ethics, involved in thinking about how do you frame information so that it's most important, that it has the proper valence, and that it responds to the kinds of questions and needs that someone has when they're making a choice. And far too often the notion of making a choice gets lost in the process of giving consent or signing a consent form or any of those things. So the final rule basically requests that there be a framing of the choice. It also says that the informed consent must begin with a concise and focused presentation of key information that's most likely to assist the subject in understanding the reason why one might or might not want to participate in the research. Again, we were, Celia and I were talking about the, the, your CURE study, and I don't know how many people know about it, but we were also talking about PrEP study in adolescents. And, and just the idea that so often it's the case that we enroll people in intervention studies without any mention to them of what happens at the end of the study. Are they going to be left worse off than they were to begin with? Are we going to study them for six months and then show them the door? Is what we do in those six months going to put them at greater risk? I mean, we do all these studies where essentially we detox heroin addicts. Um, and, and if we simply showed them the door after that detox procedure, the number of overdoses would be dramatic. I mean, we know that many of them seek participation in research so that they can get detoxed and lower the amount and, and, and increase their sensitivity to heroin again. But the question is, how good are we at describing certain fundamental facts about research participation? The other thing that's embedded in the new rule is this notion of a reasonable person standard. Um, I don't know if any of you are attorneys uh, or know any attorneys or even talk to an attorney, <laughs> but, but the reasonable person standard is something that has a, a solid place in law. And I'm not going to get into the legal implications of it. I want to talk about some of the intuitive implications of it. But it says the prospective subject 
or legally authorized representative must be provided with the information that a reasonable person would want to have in order to make an informed decision about whether to participate. And intuitively, this means that the standard of information provided is not what the risk management department of the hospital would want, or what the most nervous member of the IRB thinks is a critical piece of information. But to the extent possible, the goal is to put yourself in the position of the reasonable research subject and make a determination about what information would be most relevant. Now, trust me, there's a vast literature on how one goes about arriving at that conclusion. But as I see it, it's intended, to, one of the things that it does is it focuses the concern again on what the person might need to know to make a choice and not what are the other factors, we'll call them institutionally oriented, that contribute to the heft of the current consent forms and the problems with informed consent. There's a new required element. Now, the way the informed consent in the regulations reads is there are eight things that have to be in a consent form. Now, of, of course, the way consent has evolved over the years is that the list of those eight things, the order in which it appears in the regulations, is traditionally the same order in which it's appeared in consent forms for as many years <coughs> as the regulations have existed. In other words, there hasn't been a compelling empirical literature that says there's a better way to present the information to facilitate understanding, right? So just to make that point, those eight criteria get transferred into a consent form and filled in often at great length. There's a new ninth required element, and, and by the way, that's why I make the point that, so in my institution, for example, we change the order um, we think that, for example, alternatives to research participation, right, is critical. It belongs at the beginning. First you find out what the study is offering you, and then you find out what your alternatives are, and that's the essence of the choice you're being asked to make. In the traditional consent forms, if you ever read one by industry, maybe it's in your book, deep into the consent form on page 20 of 28, there's one line called alternatives. If you're awake by the time you get there, it doesn't tell you very much. But if you want to facilitate choice, there are ways to do that by emphasizing the order and emphasis in the consent document. Unrelated, the ninth element, okay? So for, we're gonna talk a lot about this concept, but for research that involves the collection of identifiable private information, the, a consent form will now require, where it's relevant, that identifiers might be removed and the information or biospecimens could then be used for future research studies or distributed to another investigator without additional informed consent. So the, the way it works is, once something is de-identified, whether it's your data or a biospecimen, the federal regulations no longer apply. So you come to my institution, I make you read this incredibly long and dull consent form, which appears to you in certain ways like a commitment on my part to you to do certain things and not do others. And then I, when you walk out the door, I take your name off of it and I throw your name away. And then that gives me, according to this, carte blanche to do with what I see fit. That ain't right, <laughs> in my view. On the other hand, since the field has been doing it for a very long time, the fact that the new regulations require people to be notified of it at least gives them the understanding about whether or not that will occur, which at least facilitates choice. Now, what I said about all bets being off once you delete their names is not necessarily true. Some institutions, like mine, if an institutional investigator wants to ship specimens to an investigator in another facility, we can still require the investigator at the other facility abide by the terms of the consent document. Like in other words, if you 
signed a consent form and and it said we promise not to make human animal hybrids with your DNA. Even if I took your name off of it, right, and I sent it to another university, we might, for research that's as important as that, or objectionable as it might be, we wouldn't want to like find somebody walking around with your head and arms and the body of a goat. Um, you wouldn't want that. In that kind of instance, we might tell the other institutions, we are giving you this data or specimen under the assumption that you will not use it for these purposes. In general, regulations provide l broad latitude for biospecimens to be used in whatever way is possible. At least under the new regulations, the new consent form must tell someone explicitly if that's your intent. And then there are additional elements. Briefly, these are things that people care about. Studies show that these are things that people care about. They want to know, a la Henry out of Lacks, whether there'll be profit that emerges from the specimens. Uh, they want to know if they're going to learn anything or get any feedback about what the investigators find. Uh, and, and if, in fact, the whole genome is going to be sequenced and identified, so there'll be a, a test tube and a data sheet that describes the entirety of your genome sequence, we think that people ought to know about that. Preconditions for consent. So this is not new to you, but the fundamentals of consent are that we need to disclose information, uh, that that information needs to be comprehended or understood by the research subject, and that the subject needs to be able to use that in a way that's voluntary, that's, that's free from undue influence or con uh, coercion. We'll talk about what that means in a minute, but but the question that I want you to think about for all of these things is what are our standards? And how do we apply the standards? How much information is the right amount of information? Let me ask you this question. I want to do a blood test in my research study. I'm going to draw a single tube of blood. It, it involves one needle stick. In the consent form, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to draw a tube of blood. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to use it for. You're not going to have a problem with that. Do I need to write in the risk section of the consent form from your perspective as subject? Do I need to write in the risk section that the needle stick associated with the drawing of blood may cause some discomfort or bruising at the injection site? Do I need, who, hands up, who thinks I need to include that from your perspective? Who thinks I shouldn't include that? Because everybody understands that. Wait, who thinks I should not include that risk? A couple of people, and who thinks I should? Okay, and who hasn't voted? <laughs> okay, and why haven't you voted? Because um, you're like an IRB administrator. I'm an IRB manager, yeah. I'm actually, we, I, I actually go by what the researcher thinks should be in there. If they think, I mean, we have, like, for example, if it's reasonable what the researcher put in there subjects and we're fine with that. We're kind of, um, we're not, we're not IRB that kind of holds a stick over it. Well, I'm asking you, Michelle. Oh, as a subject? Yeah. Funny, no. If you, you would want to. Okay. So I ask that question all the time mm -hmm. because it's so simple and I can never get agreement on it. I mean, normally it's 50-50. I think it was about 50-50 pro and, and con and then a lot of people who, who um, uh, uh, didn't vote. But, but it's funny to me how we can't agree, I and mean, you sent me this note, how can it be that IRBs can't agree on something like what should be exempt and what's not? But even on something as simple as whether or not you need to tell an adult that it hurts to get a blood test, <laughs> people don't agree on that. So anyway, what are the standards? What kind of information? Can I how do we just- question about that? Yeah. Do you think, and we could ask us, I guess, are we disagreeing because we really disagree about that? Because my, the, the <coughs> reason I hesitate is I feel like there's a legal issue, not a moral or ethical issue. The legal issue is that if my, if you hurt me and I get a bruise, I'm going to sue you? Right, that we live in a sort of, what in my mind is a ridiculous world where everything is litigated and that, and I don't know if our disagreement is this, based. This, this cup contains a hot right, beverage? Well, right, yeah. exactly. So. <laughs> I don't know if, if our disagreement on this is based on sort of covering our asses or if it's based on 
people really should know every possible thing that can happen versus, versus where we draw the lines differently, which would be two very different sources of discussion or debate about the issue. So I had that conversation with the folks at OHRP. We were on our usual whatever conference call. And, and, and really, we could make, no one made a decision either. And I think, obviously, we're influenced by that. We're also influenced by the fact that the regulation talks about you have to include foreseeable risks, right? And I guess that's a foreseeable risk. I don't know. I, I mean, it takes a little bit of, it does take some boldness to be willing not to put that in, you know, because of the kinds of, because the culture and the climate that you talk about. And it's hard not to do something that's always been done. But that's how we arrived in 2017 with consent forms that are 28 right, pages so long. Because long. everybody sitting around the table, plus the sponsor, plus the funding agency, have their own, you know, I would say that we're like great worst case scenario generators. You know, what if, the, what if it gets infected and the arm falls off? And, you know, and, and then on the way to the hospital, you cause a bus to crash and everyone on the bus, you know what I mean? You can, you can generate the worst case scenario. And, and, and it, it takes something bolder than that, like regulatory change, to allow for uh, allow for reduction in the nonsense. But there are some things that we know, right? We know that subject understanding of the consent form is inversely related to the length. We know that. If you really care fundamentally about the choice at hand, and you believe that telling someone that the pain of the blood stick is not going to be fundamental to their choice because they already know that, then you leave it out. If you believe that someone would never in their right mind take an experimental drug if they thought that six months later it wouldn't be available to them and they would have to return to their state of unhealth, that's a critical thing to tell them. We also know <coughs> that consent tends to focus on descriptions of the purpose and the procedure rather than alternatives and risks. Why does it do that? Well, we don't have independent authority doing consent. We could, right? I mean, we could have constructed a system where you have a sort of ombuds person who discusses consent with research subjects, right? But we don't. The investigator does it, or the investigator worse than the investigator is the investigator's underling. And all the kinds of things that would cause them to focus on purpose and procedure and not on alternatives and risks are, are, are active, right? I spend, my, I spend my whole career designing a research study. I'm excited about it. I'm enthusiastic about it. I'm going to promote it whether I'm realizing it or not. I care about that. And I'm going to talk to you in detail about the procedures. I may less likely emphasize alternatives and risks, and I'm saying that this is sometimes significant and sometimes nuanced, but there's bias there in how we present information in consent forms sometimes. I'm not going to get into the therapeutic misconception. Everybody knows what that is? So give me a nod, yes or no. Okay. The th so the therapeutic misconception is this idea that research subjects often assume more direct clinical benefit from research participation than is actual. And they also tend to assume that research is individualized to meet their needs in ways that it's not. But what I want to make a point about for this today is that you shouldn't think about it as a kind of subject-based psychopathology, like denial of illness. Okay, The therapeutic misconception may be what we used to call them in the hospital setting iatrogenic or medically induced or a result of the way that we conduct informed consent. We, it's not too hard to disabuse people of some of the misconception about the clinical value of research. We just do a lousy job of it. Okay? It's a really important concept, but we shouldn't treat it like it's an element of psychopathology or a predisposition of people who participate in research that can't be addressed by due diligence on our part. And then there are things that are clearly true. We, we're not really good at explaining randomization, the double blind, and how research differs from care. Whether we like it or not, 
we all get institutionalized in science and in and and, and I'll say this also. I you know, it's not a biomedical problem for those of you who think of yourselves as social medical social behavior researchers. Terms of art are true of any profession and any field of scholarship. And I find that some of the most complicated and difficult to understand protocols and consents are written by sociologists and ethnographers and, and, and anthropologists, not because they don't write well, but because they're, they're filled with terms of art that are not understood by people who are outside the profession. We need to do a better job of explaining things which to are to us intuitive but not to subjects. You know, the lady who called me despairing and, and crying on the phone, her husband screaming in the background, she signed the agreement, she can't afford to travel to the hospital, it's too, too late to get out of it. This is a woman who has a job and works and probably is you know, undereducated by our standards but fundamentally just doesn't understand what the fundamental issue about consent was, was that it was not a contract or an agreement and that it was voluntary. I'm sure it was written in the consent document if she read it or could read it, but fundamentally we didn't do a good job of explaining to her what it was about. I can't tell you how many people don't understand what randomization is, right? And so you know, I've struggled when, as I revise consent documents to explain you will get either the active drug or the inactive drug every day for the duration of the, of the study. And even that can be misinterpreted to mean on some days you get the one drug and one. So, so you have to struggle with that language to be clear. But more than making sure you're clear with it in writing, it's an easy thing to correct when you're talking to someone or by drawing a picture. The other thing is that people have strange expectations in the research setting. And this was said to me by the mother of a young man I saw who had a, an acute psychosis, who was seen at another medical center and had a research MRI. I said, what did the research MRI show? And she said, I never, uh, I don't know, but I'm sure they would have told me if they found something wrong. Her assumption was that, that the hospital Actually, I had the same conversation with my daughter about a, a medical test that she said. She said, they didn't tell me, but I'm sure if it was something wrong, they would have told me. Don't make those assumptions in medical care. Certainly don't make them in research. We don't know that that research institute reads MRIs that are done for research purposes. But, but the assumption was, of course, if I have my son has an MRI, they're going to tell me the results. And that wasn't the case, actually, in the study. Back to this notion of choice. You know this better than I poor education and literacy, poor health literacy, poor scientific literacy. I feel a little bit guilty using the word poor because I think that even average education, literacy, health literacy, and scientific literacy is probably not enough to unravel or understand some of the complexities of consent. There is the whole spectrum of impaired decision making, not for today's discussion, but it's really about the extent to which people can or cannot comprehend and use the information for a range of cognitive or situational factors, dementia, intoxication, and so on. Urgency, captivity, desperation, limited access to care, these are things which may impact voluntariness, right? The terrible joke about the depressed patient who's told the chances of dying are one in a thousand and she says, I hope I'm the one. It's a distortion of the interpretation of the meaning of risk, and her ability to appreciate the risks of the study are influenced by her suicidal feelings. Difficulty in understanding the choice, what are the options that are presented with me, false expectations, we talked about the therapeutic misconception, and difficulty in understanding research concepts and methods. All these kinds of things are the things that we need to engage in battle as we think about enhancing consent. And then things like investigator bias and inadequate attention by the field to the process that promotes meaningful decision making. That's your job. You get two years to do it, right? And one more for some of you. Frame the choice that subject's being asked to make. 
It's easy to do that. We're asking you to make a decision about whether you want to get regular care or whether you want to participate in this experimental intervention or whatever it is. <coughs> Help the subject find the forest, right? The details are not something that's so important. The IRB may make you tell exactly how many minutes or how many steps there are from the office to the lab or whatever, but the bigger picture questions need to be pr pr uh, presented. Debulk the consent form. Some of our simplest studies from our HIV group are so long and include so much information that's well written and nice, but nobody really should be asked to read that because it's not really relevant to the decision. And the distinctions that are important, and you can think about how this applies to the work that you do, really need to be made distinct. In, in my view, for example, many of you conduct elaborate assessments. Many of you have PhDs after your name. People don't know what a psychologist is. They certainly don't know what an epidemiologist is. If you call yourself doctor, they think you're a doctor. And if you spend an hour with a doctor and they collect reams of personal information, well, they may assume that they're going to learn something or that it's going to help them in some fashion, even if you tell them otherwise. Make important distinctions, even though, you know, or the lengthy assessments and tests will not be will not be helpful to you in guiding your care, for example. The many research tests and assessments will not provide information that will guide your current or future medical or psychological treatment. We put that in the consent form. We want people to understand that. That's really important. People assume otherwise. You do not need to take part in research to receive treatment for your condition. Okay. Sometimes if what's being offered in the research is often available, we're doing an intervention, a psychosocial intervention to reduce drug use. There are similar interventions that are available outside of the research. We can help you with a referral if you would like that. But people should know what their options are. The treatment you would receive differs from care you would receive if you did not take part in the research in the following ways. And you enumerate those. And most importantly, if you're doing an intervention, whether it's a behavioral or, or psychosocial or prevention work, you should just be clear, we don't know if it works. That's why we're doing it. It should say that. We do not know if it works. People use rhetoric all the time. We're, we're doing this study to see how well it works. Well, how well it works is not the same as if it works and conveys something different. And again, you know, if there's a blind and you're not going to break the blind, people need to know that. These are just some examples of the kinds of things that I think are important to have, I'm going to say, an adult discussion and to treat somebody with respect and to foster their decision making. Or you can word things like this. The efficacy of the investigational <coughs> treatment has not yet been established. What does that mean? <laughs> I see that all the time. We don't know if the study drug works, if it will help treat your condition. There's a better way of putting it, right? And so one of the things that I don't like is that, you know, someone may run a consent form through some of those reading level checkers and come out with the reading level and decide it's satisfactory. But it, it, it's really, it's not the overall reading level. It's the way that things are phrased and discussed. The new medication has already been studied in 17 people and is generally well tolerated. I, I'm hoping that you're thinking of analog analogies in your work. What, what's wrong with this? Does this bother anybody? Anybody? Do you like it? No, the generally well tolerated from students. What does it mean? Yeah, my reaction to this is to wonder what does it mean that it's already been studied in exactly. 17 people? Yeah. Is that a lot? Is that a little? Why are you doing it with me? <laughs> When we revised this study, we, this consent, we said the investigational drug has only been studied in 17 right. people. And although it was generally well tolerated in this small group of subjects, even common and serious problems may not yet be known. Right. And, and that's the difference between writing things in a way that the trained and sophisticated medical reader may comprehend, may, and writing in a way that someone who doesn't spend their lives at a, at a, at a, at a, in a university medical center <laughs> think about. 
you have to explain to them that even common risks would be known if only 17 people had been exposed to it. I mean, it should say, that's nothing, okay? It's even worse in behavioral research, and this may be true in medical research, because the people administering the consent forms themselves have not been trained. So, so if, if I were to write that first sentence and I knew what it meant, the person who then does the consent doesn't know what it means anyway, so there's zero chance that they can clarify or explain it better. Exactly. I didn't, I took this slide out, but training of what are the standards for who may get consent I think is an important mm -hmm. consideration. But, but you know, I, I, was, I was listening to a, a, a story on BBC Radio. There was a psychologist in England who interviewed 24 women who had been, uh, who lost their hair in the context, oh, who lost their hair in the context of treatment for breast cancer. And it was their ideas and attitudes of, about that. And she was drawing all these, what I felt were kind of outrageous conclusions based on 24 people. And, and, and it's just, when I talk about scientific literacy, I think you all know that you would be cautious about drawing conclusions. But I think the lay public doesn't know that. I like the idea of sort of highlighting or making people a little bit more vigilant. There are some things you should pay special attention to as you consider this choice, and then you enumerate them. And what we do is that we create this cover sheet in our studies, more than minimal risk studies in general. And it, and it just basically says some of those things that I, I, I talked about here. Um, I think I, you don't have to read through this, but this is an example of what we use as a cover sheet to emphasize those facts that we think are most critical to the choice. And I actually think that this kind of model may work as the introduction for the kind of consent document that's required under the new rule. But let me just say that there's no good guidance at this point about what the feds are expecting about that cover sheet or that introduction that I talked about. However, uh, there will probably be a significant amount of chatter about it between now and, and, and January. I, I actually wrote this consent form and I came up with the drug Exelon as, as a pretend drug, but now there actually is a drug called Exelon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm switching gears now, and I want to talk about the secondary uses of, of identifiable information or biospecimens pre-2018, and I'll try to speed up so we have time to talk. So prior to the new rule, if I collected data from you, if I collected data from all of you, about your drug and sexual history. And I had your name attached to it. And I kept it in a locked filing cabinet in my locked office. And I collected that information from you because I wanted to understand the prevalence of certain kinds of risky sexual behavior related to drug use in people who are interested in research efforts. An important issue for our time. And then five years later, I get a doctoral student who comes to me and says, I have a really interesting idea uh, about, about this cohort that you studied. And, and I have data from other cohort, cohorts. I'd like to combine them. And I want to use the information that you have on these folks to do my other study. How do I do that? How can I do that? How can this? Post doctor, this other postdoc student do it? How would she access the identifiable information? Well, there's a number of ways that she could do it. She could contact you all and say, uh, hello, you <coughs> participated in a research study five years ago. I'd like to use your information for additional research and get your specific consent. She could go to the IRB and say, there's no way I'm going to be able to contact, contact all these people and get permission. It's impracticable for me to get their consent. Uh, and, uh, and I'll be really careful with the data. I won't lose their names. I'll protect their privacy. The IRB could grant a waiver of consent if all the conditions for waiver were granted. And the other thing that I could do technically is that the researcher that I could do is I could strip your names off of it, right? take all the identifying information off of it, and just hand the data set over to the student. Those are three ways that I could 
accomplish that secondary research study. The notion of broad consent is that it provides a way, a context, for researchers to obtain broad permission for the later unspecified uses of research data that's identifiable and biospecimens, right? And the secondary use could be of data that is either collected primarily for research purposes, like the kind I just talked about, or data that was collected for clinical purposes. So you go to the student health service here at Fordham, and when you go there, they give you a broad consent form, and it says you are patient here at the Fordham Visiting Ready Fellow Program, and uh, we'd like you to agree to allow us to use any leftover specimens that you that we collect from you here and your medical data for research in the following areas. And they enumerate those. And it tells you what they're not going to use it for. And it tells you that they may share that information with others, etc. That would be an example of a broad consent. And what it would mean is that if in a few years' time somebody came along and wanted to use biospecimens from student health, they would be able to go to the IRB and say, we want to collect this information and we want to study it. And the IRB would decide whether a new exemption category applied. And if it did, and my proposed use was consistent with the terms of the consent form that you signed, then the IRB might allow that research to occur as exempt. So broad consent basically provides a mechanism other than waiver or de-identification for already collected biospecimens to be used for future unspecified purposes. But it's complicated. And one of the things that's new here is that in order, I'm not going to talk about exemptions today, but in order for the IRB to approve an exemption, it has to conduct a limited review. And the limited review is basically to make sure that the newly proposed research is consistent with the terms that were specified previously. And if you refuse when you go to student health to sign the broad consent form, As an institution, I need to track that fact. In other words, I need to keep tabs on what you decided you weren't willing to do. Because if another investigator comes along and proposes the same kind of study and goes to the IRB and says, I want a waiver of consent, the IRB needs to know that you've already declined participation in that kind of research. And so what's clear is that although broad consent at major institutions that have fancy information systems may be able to have lots of ability to track these kinds of things, the new rule basically says that the assumption is that broad consent will likely at first be used by individual researchers and research teams who will have the ability to track within their subject pools when people get informed consent or not. Let me just say a few more things about it. And I mentioned this. The consent needs to include a description of the types of research, again, that a reasonable person would expect. So if I said to you, I'm going to do research on the origins of mental illness. If I said I was going to do research on, on the relationship of diet to diabetes, and then instead used your data on research having to do with schizophrenia, we would argue that a reasonable person wouldn't expect that secondary use as falling in the category that you gave permission for. So the IRB might decline to exempt the research. 
other things that make sense. How the information will be shared, how long it will be kept, who get it. And um, okay, and sorry, and that they will not be informed of the details of any specific research studies that might be conducted. So the idea is that I want to be able to have broad latitude in how I use your sample, but I want you to understand that once you give this broad permission, you lose control over your data and your specimen. And I'm bound to only use it within the specified categories and purposes and for the time allowed. What's good again here is that it's explicit to say what people won't find out about. You know, all of this stuff, and here's the ethics, all of this stuff is, and Celia and I talk about this, is the idea that people only care about their data to the extent that it's identifiable and things could come back to haunt them. And there I think, particularly in certain communities, there are strong feelings about ownership of data and biospecimens, right? And whether or not my name is on my cells, I may feel, number one, that I don't want it to be used by the big bad medical establishment. What am I getting? That I think that there's a history of abuse of people, Henry Lacks example, and I don't really like the idea of companies profiting without my knowing about it. And two, I don't fully trust that you're going to do with the samples as you say you will. There are reasons that people feel connected to their biospecimens, but in general, the regulations are taking a different position, and the position is the only risk is if it's identifiable. There's a new waiver of consent requirement, as I mentioned. And this means, does anyone know what the waiver of consent requirements are? Basically, if I want to waive consent for a study, let's say I want to do a chart review, I just need to convince the IRB, uh, essentially, that I'm going to protect the privacy of the information that it's very difficult or impracticable for me to actually get consent for it, that not getting consent is not going to hurt you, affect your rights of welfare, and that if relevant, I would debrief you about information that was learned. In the new rule, there's an additional element, and it says that if the research involves identifiable private information, the research could not practically be carried out with using the information in an identifiable format. And that's a new bar. It basically says that if you apply for a waiver of consent for that same chart review that I just discussed, I'm going to say to you, you really need to have the people's names in your data set. And if you say, you know what, I can do without them, that's better. But you need to justify whether or not you need the names or not. Now you may, but that's the point. As I mentioned before, consent will no longer be required for the purpose of screening, recruiting, or determining the eligibility of prospective subjects if the following conditions are met. One, the investigator will obtain information through oral or written communication with the subject. And I think that means that you're giving me information over the phone. I'm looking for people who are over 5'2". Are you over 5'2"? Yes. Okay. I don't need your consent to get that. <laughs> the investigator will obtain information, biospecimens, by accessing records or stored identifiable biospecimens. So a record review would be exempt. I mentioned that one consent form used to enroll subjects must be posted to a federal website after subject enrollment is completed within 60 days of the last subject completing the trial. And that's only for clinical trials conducted or supported by a federal agency. How many of you have had to post your research on clinicaltrials.gov? Okay, if you've had to do that, then this is the same definition of clinical trial. And I, I won't get into it, but basically 
one or more human subjects, one or more interventions, and the point is to evaluate the biomedical or behavioral health related outcomes. It's a broad definition. I think IRBs will have a lot of discretion in deciding what is and what isn't a clinical trial. But in this case, to post a consent form, it needs to be federally supported. supported. Who is a legally authorized representative? Who can consent on your behalf of you becoming capable is determined often by state law. The problem is that many states don't have laws about who may do this. And it's been a big problem for people who do research with incapable subjects, the seriously mentally ill, some demented patients, patients in intensive care settings. <coughs> what this rule really does is it says if there's no applicable state law, then whatever the institution has decided about who can provide care in the clinical context can provide care or decisions in the research context. It's a very liberal interpretation of the rules. And the reason I said before is that I'm uneasy about it is that the decision to enroll someone in a, in a research study is different from the decision to enroll them in research, uh, in clinical care. Right, when I make a clinical decision for someone, my job is to make a decision in their best interests. In research, the research may not offer the direct benefit. So how much latitude and who should be able to enroll, enroll an adult who can't make a decision for him or herself in a research study? And what safeguards are in place? This is actually from the Nuremberg Code. It says, the duty and responsibility for ascertaining the quality of the consent rests upon each individual who initiates, directs, or engages in the experiment. I think that's still true. And I think that's really the argument that we have to, the, the case that we have to make. And I think that we need to do an active job at paying more attention to how we do consent. I think we have the ability to do so. We need to find the time. Stop there. Thank you.